if you have two screen, um, if you have two screens, you might be able to do this on your computer, as long as you can see the zoom on one screen and open up your internet browser on the other screen to www.kahootit, that's www.kahoot.it. And then when you uh, get it on that site, it'll ask you for a game pin and your game pin is 795-9374. 795-9374. And then I'll ask for a um, nickname. You can use a game alias name, your gamer name, or you can just put in your, uh, your first name, whatever you're more comfortable with. Mm -hmm. I, I, I am in Tamara, so it's it's working. Okay, so you can stop sharing that screen, and I'll I'll share mine. Sure. Um, if I stop sharing the screen, will they still be able to see the the pin number? No, well, they won't. So okay, let's let's leave it up a couple more seconds. Well, yeah, they will because when I share my screen, it has the pin number as well. Okay. Oh, excellent. Okay, so yeah, I so will drop it in the chat as well. Oh, thank you. Cool. All right, so let's just to figure out how to stop sharing my screen. I have, it's always a problem when you have um, three monitors going at the same time. I'm like, ah, I don't know which screen I'm looking at. <laughs> hey, so who he wrote Paul Not Steen as their name? Oh, Paul. <laughs> <slash>. <laughs> okay, oh, good. So that means now. you can see it. I was just going to ask if you could see it. So it looks like you can. So, um, more people are joining. Um, so this is just for fun, everyone. There's no prizes. I think at one workshop or conference, they had actual prizes. This is just for fun. Um, there's a little podium thing at the end. I'll see, see if you're the winner or not. Um, you'll get points for not only if you get a right answer, but you'll also get points how fast you answer if there's multiple people who get the right answer. Um, and Paul, how many people, I can't see my top of, how many participants are there? It see? looks like there's 22 people logged in right now. Um, uh, and there's 37 participants in the webinar. Okay, so we yeah, have so, about two thirds participation right now. So and I'll, the number's still going up. Yeah, I'll wait just a little bit. I'll get started here in a second. You can join in anytime. So if you're having trouble, don't worry. Uh, if you're having trouble, don't stress about it. Just play along with yourself and you'll know uh, how well you did. That's what's the most important. It's just to get our brain thinking about uh, aquatic macroinvertebrate identification, which we maybe haven't done. Well, I haven't done since September. Um, some of you did it in October, I think. All right, so we're gonna get started. The first uh, isn't really a question um, as far as right or wrong answer. It's just a poll. I wanted to get an idea of when it comes to aquatic macroinvertebrate ID, what level of expertise do you feel like you have? Do you feel like you're a beginner, um, somewhere between a beginner and expert at the order level, uh, expert at the orders, but maybe a beginner at the family level, or an expert at family identification? Um, and we have 40 seconds to finish this one. All the other questions, you only have 20 seconds. Um, I just wanted to make sure I had enough time um, to, again, let people get logged on um, with that pin number at the bottom of the screen. Um, and then just, if everybody answers, it'll end a little sooner. Okay, so we have a bit of variety. Um, just two of you feel like you're expert at the family ID, which is okay. Um, we have mostly people who feel like they're somewhere between a beginner and an expert at the order level. So that's good for us to know. All right, so we're going to get started with the actual quiz questions now. So. Um, the quickness gets you more points. Mm -hmm. 
So the first question is, what order does this individual belong to? Is it part of the Trichoptera or Caddisfly family, Ephemeroptera, Mayfly, Dipterans, Trueflies, or Placoptera, Stoneflies? Answers are coming in quick. The correct answer was the Trichoptera or Caddisfly. The hint for this one was the case. Um, many of the trichopteras have a case that they live in, but some are um, free living. They have nets instead of cases. All right, the next question. Well, first I forgot to see the scoreboard. Here's the top five people. Great job, Alex. Here's the next question. What order do these belong to? They all belong to the same order. I gave you a big hint there with the common name. Can you give me the Latin name for the order? The correct answer was Coleoptera. All of these uh, beetles belong to the Coleoptera order. Okay. Alex is keeping his lead, but Dippy Diptera is on the cat on the chase. Mm -hmm. All right, the next one. What family of mayfly does this belong to? This is one of my favorites. I always say he's so cute. Mm -hmm. All right, it looks like 11 of you got it right with Batiscidae, which is uh, a different mayfly in that you can't see its gills very well because they're underneath this carapace. Um, they look like a little ninja turtle. That's what I think of when I see them in the field. All right, next. Alex is still keeping his lead. What order and family does this individual belong to? So I mixed it up with some common names and Latin names here. This one was uh, Terranarsidae, which is one of my favorite uh, stoneflies. They can get quite large. Um, I think their common name actually has something to do with the size of it. Um, no, it's a stonefly by the two um, appendages coming off the back. All right. Ooh, Paul not seen is taking the lead. What order do these belong to? Again, they all belong to the same order. You have both the common and Latin names of their families, but what order do these belong to? And looks like most everyone got this one, right? Those are hemipterans. Um, their commonality is they all have piercing mouth parts. And um, with hemipterans, the young look just like the adults for the most part. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul Nutstein is keeping their lead. Mm -hmm. What is the family and sensitivity rating of this dragonfly larva? So uh, I want the family, but this is also, also to remind you that each family of an order can have different sensitivity ratings, and that's important with the new macroinvertebrate scoring system. Ooh, yay, most everybody got it right, Gampede, and it has a sensitivity level of one, which is the most sensitive. The higher the sensitivity level is, it's actually 
more tolerant to pollution. All right, Paul Nut Steen still keeping the lead. Two more questions. What family does this belong to? This one was a calapterigid, which most everyone got right. Uh, it is a damselfly. It uh, can be recognized by those long, sturdy antenna and then the three uh, gill filaments. One more question. Can Alex retake the lead is the question. Hmm? Which of the following does not belong to the order Diptera or true flies, which is uh, the purpose of to the rest of today's talk, to talk about the order Diptera. Don't worry if you can't get this. That's why we're having this uh, presentation today. Oh, yay. And everybody got most everybody. I mean, the majority. Got it right, 14 people. Um, this is uh, not a true fly. And the way you can tell that is it has legs and true flies do not have legs. So let's see who won. Alex, hat third. Oh, I was gonna get excited because I thought that was first, but I forgot they show that first. So I bet it's Paul Steen, not Steen. Paul not Steen is our winner. But thanks for everybody who played. And I will stop sharing my screen. Good job, Paul Natstein. That's probably Paul Weimer slash from the Osable Institute. But I guess someone could, anyone could have called themselves Paul Natstein. So maybe not. He's probably laughing right now. Okay, let me. Let me bring up my PowerPoint and I will share my screen. Alex put in the chat, good game. So good sportsmanship. With okay, that. so so the <laughs> settings, the settings must be different on this particular um, one. It looks like people can can type in chat. Um, so you guys all had the chance of trash talking and you didn't use it. <laughs> I forgot to mention that at the beginning. Um, do you see my, do you see the presentation, Tamara? Did I do it right? Yep, I see it. Okay, good. So tricky dipterans. Uh, thank you, Tamara, for leading us off as kind of a reminder of the broad array of macroinvertebrates that are in this um, that, you know, that we, we work to identify as, uh, as all members of, of my core stream monitoring programs. Um, but uh, I think we, those were, those were the slightly easier ones. If you really want to get into the hard stuff, that is dipterins. And uh, the purpose of this presentation is to help you with those uh, so that your results can be as accurate as possible. Um, so, uh, I, you know, we have, just in terms of housekeeping, we, we have, I, I believe that we still have the question and answer form. Is that right, Tamara? I can't see all that. Yeah, stuff we do. We do. So screen. if okay. you have any questions, put them in the chat. And then at the end, I will read the questions off to Paul if we have time. And I think we will. I, I have 20 slides and we have 40 minutes. So I think we will have time at the end for questions. So, um, so get those in as, as we go. Um, if there's like a really burning one that you see, Tamara, like I said something wrong or just feel free to interrupt me and I'll. Okay, and I'll sounds good. Correct, correct it uh, right, in, right in that moment. 
So first, just a quick look at our new, uh, I mentioned this in the last presentation, but we can talk about it a little bit more now. The new identification and scoring scheme that we're, we're starting up to use this year um, for the stream program. Um, and a, a couple of, of reasons, again, why, why we did this. The old system had some, had some flaws in it, and that was giving us less accurate data than uh, we, we would have, then we can have using this new scheme. Um, some of the issues is like I've mentioned, it would, it, was, it would treat some insects the same, even if they were quite a bit different. So uh, stoneflies are the, are the most sensitive basically. Well, there's some above it, but among the most sensitive, something like a mayfly actually has a wide range there's particular species of mayfly that are quite sensitive, but there's also some mayflies that are not sensitive at all. Now, when you're only identifying at the order level, like we're doing here for this uh, for this assessment, um, you know, some some of that fine detail gets gets lost. So, and the way we actually computed these numbers is we were we looked at the the mayflies that would be found in Michigan, and we just took the the average sensitivities for the different species, and we ended up with 3.5. So that's where all of these numbers come from, actually. Like caddisfly is, is an average of probably 12 different families, eventually ending us up at a 3.2. Um, so anyway, all of that gives us more accurate results. And, and one of the issues that that always bugged me about the old system that we were happy to fix is uh, is the true fly issue. Uh, basically, there are some true flies that are, are quite sensitive to pollution, and you, you see them here. The aethericity under the old system that that was included as a sensitive insect, uh, and people were asked to to identify that separately. But the Blepheceridae and the Dixidae, in particular the Dixidae, uh, because it's it's more common, uh, were, were being shunted into the uh, into the very tolerant um, macro invert, or the very tolerant true fly section. And so the point of this new scheme is, you know, now we have a level of accuracy there that that we didn't have before. Um, I, I go into all of this and and how to calculate the score if it's not clear uh, in, in quite some detail that in the training that we did back in June. So if you check out the link here, you can get to all the, the recorded trainings uh, that we did uh, in, on June 17th. Um, five months ago today, we were doing that. So, so that's all I'm going to really say about the new rating system. Just know that that recording exists for for refresher to understand better why we did why we did this. So so when speaking of dipterins in this scheme, um, yeah, I guess I guess I just covered some of this, but the idea is that we are now dividing them into three groups. We have the very sensitive ones of, of these particular three families that I, that I mentioned, given a, a 1.0 rating. We have the most tolerant true flies, including something like a you know, mosquito can be found basically anywhere, even in mud puddles or, or the, the worst places, um, in addition to being found in nice places. That's the thing about, about uh, the tolerance level it doesn't mean you're not going to find them in nice places. It just means you're not going to find the good ones in the bad places. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, and then everything else besides those six families gets put into this somewhat sensitive group at, at a which gives a 6.0 score. So the hope is that in dividing it in this manner, uh, you know, we have a, this catch-all category, which can be dangerous, but it also can be a blessing because if you know those six, the three up here and the three down here, if you know those really well, 
then any other dipterin that you find, you can put in this middle category, and that will give you the most accurate result set that you can get. So what we're going to do in this presentation then is cover these six really well, because the goal is for you to, to be able to recognize those on site. Um, I'd say all of them are totally doable by site ID only. The exception might be a Dixid. You might want to get that one under a microscope, but all the others you should just be able to look at and, and know what it is. All right. So that's kind of the, the goal of today. But to start off, uh, do we even have a true fly? So this is just a really simple key here that, but, but this is, this is what you'll see if you go to a, a longer uh, book that has uh, a long drawn out key. And, and, and the basic gist is if, uh, if something has legs, first of all, if something has legs, it's not going to be a dipterin. Um, if something has no segments, then you're also not a dipterin. If something doesn't have legs, no shell, no segments, we're actually looking at a flatworm or a roundworm. So that's the first mental step you go through trying to figure out something, if something's a dipterin. Now, in terms of segments, dipterins only have somewhere between 10 and 20, usually, of distinct segments that you can see with your, with your eyes. Um, and you'll see as we go through the pictures in this presentation, you'll, you'll Keep that in mind of segments and you'll see every single one of these having having segments. Um, if something has a lot of segments, like usually it's significantly more than 20, like leeches might have 40 to 50 to 60 tiny little striations, tiny little segments, um, you know, then you know you're not, you don't have a dipterin either. So low segments, no legs, that's a dipterin. Uh, and then just here's some, exa some examples of things that may uh, confuse you on that whole no legs things. Uh, a lot of dipterins, which these are all, have prolegs. So small little protuberances that, uh, that are not legs, they actually don't really have any anatomical function when they are larva, but eventually these, things will develop into legs when they, when they get older and emerge as adults. Um, so don't be thrown off by the pro legs. They don't really count as legs. They don't have like a, they can't use them for, for getting around except maybe to, I know that like the aethericity can like, kind of hold, use these to hold themselves in position a little bit, might use them as suction cups, but they're not, um, they're not really for mobility like, like in other insects. Okay, so let's look at, first of all, the, the most sensitive true flies that get an average, once you average all three of these, gets you to a one. So quite sensitive, not going to be found in polluted waters. Now, this was a very odd one. Uh, the Blephoceridae is a net winged midge. And this would be a great example of saying, what is a segment in a dipter? And like these segments could not be more obvious. Um, they also have very distinct uh, suckers that they use to maintain their position, like really big. This thing is so visually distinct. It's, uh, you know, you can identify it by sight without any issues. You just see it and you know it because there's nothing else that really looks like this. Uh, now, Tamara and I were talking about this particular one. Uh, and based on our experience, it's actually pretty rare to see. I think Tamara said she's never seen one in her sampling. I think I've seen one maybe uh, twice in the 13 years I've been with the Huron River Watershed Council. So not at least in the areas that we sample. Now we have particular areas that we tend to sample. We don't see it. It's going to be found in rocky, highly oxygenated streams. Um, so, so, you know, high quality, fast moving streams with rapids, typically, hence the need for the suckers. Uh, but Tamara and I don't see it very often. I don't know if uh, anyone else has. I definitely be, if you have, you, know, you can put your hand up or say something in chat. Um, and 
and if it wasn't so visually distinct, I probably wouldn't have even included it in the in in the uh, scoring system. But because it's so easy to learn and it's kind of special, then then it, it makes sense that it, that it has its position as one of our three sensitive dipterns. Now the Dixit Midge. Um, this is one that I think is misidentified so much that it was one of the major reasons I wanted to, to have the revamp of the insect scoring system. The top insect here is the Dixit Midge, the meniscus midge and its common name. The bottom one is a normal midge. And so the issue, as you know, the issue with midges is they're so small. Um, you, you can't really make out too much detail with the naked eye, unless you have extremely good young eyes um, or your eyes are just very highly trained to see things. So this might be the one of the batch that you actually have to at least get a magnifying glass if, if not under a microscope. But the way I do it when I'm going through my samples is uh, if I see a midge that looks a little, what I think is a midge and it looks a little weird, that is usually uh, the clue in my brain to get that one under a scope. And some reason, some ways that the meniscus midge looks weird as compared to a normal midge. Um, first of all, you see this, this tail, really it's the back of the abdomen. And actually I have a better picture on the next slide, which I'll show you. And it's hairy. So it's like got a hairy tail. Uh, and it also has a head that is always held at this weird angle. It's almost like a 180 degree head, like it can rotate it around or something. It always, always has this head at a strange angle. So when I when I go through my samples and I have what looks like a hairy midge with a broken neck, then I'm like, oh, that's probably a Dixon, you know. And then I'll I'll look at it a little more closely. Uh, here's just a a blow up of of that hairy tail, the the, the abdomen on the back end. So if you see if you see this distinctive tail, um, that, that should clue in your head that, that it requires a, a closer look as well as that, that broken head, um, broken neck. It's not really a broken neck, but it looks like that to me. So that's what I call it. Now, Tam and Tamara's experience, she, she has said that she often finds these uh, floating on the surface of the water. And they're usually in slower water. So that tends to be their preferred habitat. So if you have a stream like that, um, you know, keep an eye out for it. It might be your volunteers and not you actually doing the sample. So, you know, that's why it's important to know all the morphological characters too. But uh, yeah, so keep in mind that type of habitat. The water snipe fly, this one, we always had its own category in the old system. And so now it's just merged in with the other sensitives. Uh, this is Aethericity is the family name. The primary characters that you would look for are, is this Y-shaped terminal processes. They are ciliated, meaning there's lots of little hairs coming off of, of this, like almost like bull horns off the front of, of, of where its head will eventually be. Um, and then, Aethericity also have, have these ventral suckers called crochets, um, I believe is how it's pronounced, uh, little pro legs. Uh, and then another thing is that, uh, is that oftentimes they're green. They'll be bright green when you pull them out of the water. So that's, that's a helpful identifying character. But once you get them in alcohol, they'll probably bleach out and you'll lose that, that green color. Uh, I typically associate Aethericity with trout streams, um, you know, it's cold water. They're down there in the gravel. Um, they need lots of oxygen. So there's, they're typically gonna be in faster water with, and cold water. Okay, now we're actually going to, so with those covered, we're actually gonna jump all the way to the tolerant ones on the bottom. And so now we're thinking about mosquitoes my one of my favorite names of all of all time the rat-tailed maggot and the soldier fly so these three are all 
new insect families that we want you to learn and master um, that they, in the old days, they would have just been thrown in on the uh, other insect category, but now we're specifically identifying them. Now mosquitoes look, probably of anything, mosquitoes look most like the Dixit midge. Um, and because they have such different sensitivities, you wanna make sure you can, you can tell the difference between them because um, that would be a bad mistake to make in terms of what, what it does to your data, especially if you find them in larger numbers. So just a couple of tips really on how to tell the, the Dixit apart from the mosquito. Um, the primary thing on a mosquito is that the first and second and third, off, I think usually the third one, two. Yeah, the, those segments right here, they are enlarged and they will be hairy, okay? So uh, if you see uh, a little dipterin that has right next to the head has an enlarged set of segments, it's almost, twice the width of, of the rest of the segments going down the abdomen. Uh, that is a good sign that you have a mosquito. Also mosquitoes uh, have this, this tail in the back, it's, which is its breathing apparatus. You know, this is how mosquitoes live in water with zero oxygen is mosquitoes are actually breathing atmospheric air. So um, they don't have gills. They they breathe directly from the air that, that we breathe. Uh, here's just some other examples. You can see, you know, from the bottom picture, you can see how easy it would be if you're zoomed out, especially looking at these with the naked eye, how, how you could make this mistake because they both tend to be hairy dipterins, right? The, the, the big key rely, uh, comes down to this, uh, the, these larger segments and the fact that the dipterins once again, look like they have, or the Dixids, once again, look like they have that broken neck situation going on here. So that, those are the, the visual characters I use. Now the rat-tailed maggot, um, uh, kind, of like the mos kind of like the mosquito, it's, it's breathing air. So these things are, can be found in extreme low oxygen situations. Um, uh, the rat-tailed maggot, it, it's just so distinctive because it it looks like, uh, I hate to put my own judgment calls on it, but it's like this nasty piece of gooey flesh connected to a long tail. <laughs> and that's how it gets its name. Um, so it's pretty visually distinctive. You can see in the blow up, you know, you still can see how it has segments um, that are tend to be wrinkled. Um, if you can get it zoomed up close enough, you'll see right in here, there'll be hooks coming out of where it's, it's opening is for where it takes in food. Um, and these things, you know, based on, based on its air requirements, they can be found uh, oftentimes in wetlands. So in, in quiet margins of streams. So chances are during stream monitoring, you're not gonna find a lot of these, uh, but if you're in a really still, quiet stream, uh, you, you, may, you may come across them. Typically, I haven't found them much in the Huron uh, area, but, uh, but you might. Anyone see these uh, normally in their stream monitoring? Uh, speak up in the chat. Well, curious if, if it is the kind of thing that you'll see. Then the final, of uh, of the the tolerant dipterins is the soldier fly. Soldier flies are kind of interesting. Uh, they they can be quite diverse in terms of their size. I have seen really big ones. Uh, big being a relative word, you know, like maybe the the length of two quarters or something. I thought that would be quite large for these. And then I but I also have seen them really really small, like like the size of a mayfly, a small mayfly maybe. Um, they also can be, for, have variety with their width. The picture on the top shows a really wide 
soldier fly. And the picture on the bottom is one that's that's not really any, maybe just a little bit wider than like what a what a almid riffle beetle might look like as a larva. So you wanna if you, if you come across a really wide one that's pretty distinct, and the narrow ones are are a little trickier. Um, one thing I like to do when I think I have one is I poke it with my tweezers, because these bugs are toughened. They look leathery and they kind of feel leathery too. They have this tough exterior coating, um, not really fleshy like like some other dipterans. Like it has this toughness to it, um, and it's flattened. So dorsally ventrally flattened is how it might say in the key, um, you know, so squished, like someone pushed their hand on it and squished it down, um, that rather than being more round, okay, so, so that's, a, that's a key character for soldier flies. Once again, it's this tolerant uh, insect, it's, so it's more typically going to be found in muck, uh, it can be found in other places for sure, I regularly find these in normal river conditions. So I know they are out there, um, but uh, because of their ability to handle low oxygen situations, they, they are often found in muck when maybe other things are not. Okay, so I'm just catching my breath. Slow down a second here. Um, that, so the good news, those two categories, I, besides the Dixit midges, I feel that they are all pretty visual, visually distinct. So with a little bit of practice, a little bit of training of your eyesight, that's the kind of thing that you should be able to um, even sight ID, uh, you know, when you're, when you're going through the samples. Um, and, you know, and, and another useful aspect of this, you learn those really well, any other dipterin you find, you can put in into this somewhat sensitive group. And those tend to be some of uh, the most common dipterins you have. So crane flies, black flies, uh, normal midges, those are insects that I see in nearly every sample that I take. So there's, I'm always gonna be filling out something in this line. Um, let's take a look at those. So for me, these, these are super common. I know them really well because I see them all the time. You got your normal midges, often curls into this little sea, does a big dance when it's still alive and in the water, always has this tiny little head capsule with a pro leg right next to the head capsule. A black fly um, uh, looks like a little bowling pin if you were to get it straight up vertically with an end, the end of its abdomen is round and thick. Now, some people might confuse this with a mosquito. The head, I, I would say the head of a mosquito and the head of a black fly do look pretty visually similar. So the important thing is that you considered where is it large on the abdomen? A mosquito will be larger up here. The, the black fly will be larger down here. Other than that, they're pretty close to the same size. So that one might, might require a second look to make sure you're, you're getting that one right. Now crane flies. If uh, crane flies are are somewhat the bane of my my existence, honestly, because um, you you often find these the ones on the right, you, the uh, you know those are the really big ones. That's the uh, tip tip tipula genus T I P U L A. That's this one in this particular genus. But the problem is with crane flies is that the other genuses in this family are so different. They 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 don't necessarily look like each other at all. Like this one over here is, uh, I believe it's Antocha genus. And it's usually, it's very small and um, 
if if you weren't trained in this stuff, you might not recognize this as a crane fly. So this was another major source of error in the way we used to do things. People would find stuff like this and not call it a not call it a, a, a crane fly, but call it another dipterin. So that was a mistake that people would make. Now with the way our system works, uh, that mistake kind of covers itself because you'll just put all of these in the same category with each other. So the hope is that they'll make our results more, more accurate and fewer identification errors. Of course, this isn't all of the some, somewhat sensitive uh, uh, dipterins. There's a lot of them. And I, I don't necessarily have to, to go through each of these, but, uh, it, but there's a variety of dipterins that you will put in that somewhat sensitive group with the 6.0 sensitivity ranking. Um, and some of them you might have, depending on where you are, uh, you might have a lot of these or you might, might not even see them very often. Uh, and the Huron River, which I'm most familiar with, we see, we see quite a few of these uh, Tycopteridae, the phantom crane flies. We definitely see a lot of deer flies. I have a feeling that this that's pretty common for for most people. You'll see you'll see quite a few of those in your samples. So um, the good thing about the way we do it, you don't necessarily have to memorize each of those family types. You can just know that they're not one of the the ones you need to know that are either tolerant or, or not tolerant. Um, so you can just group them together in that catch-all category. Now, if you're uh, striving toward um, doing everything at the family level, uh, great. You know, it's just one dipterins will be a, uh, a particular challenge as you learn them. Um, it'll take you a little bit more time to learn dipterins probably than trying to learn the families of stoneflies. Which are, which are pretty easy by comparison. Uh, when I learned this stuff a long time ago in a, in a uh, college class, basically we, when, we went, when we were learning family level, we started learning first the stoneflies, then we actually moved to dragonflies because those are pretty visually distinct, all of those, and it's easy to go down the family level. And we didn't get to dipterins till the very end of the semester, which means, I didn't have much time to practice with them, but also they're just they're just hard. So the instructor wanted us to not get to them until uh, we were more practiced in other things. So I would recommend that for you too. If you're trying to learn these, start with stoneflies, start with dragonflies, then go to mayflies, do all the other groups. When you're good at everything, that would be the, the time to start to start tackling dipterins. So I'm mostly done. Um, just a, just a few other notes. Uh, you know, if you want more, you want this wasn't enough. You already knew that this stuff, which is fine. That's good. Um, in 2016, of as a part of this conference, I led a training that really dove into the dipterins and how to tell them apart at the family level. Um, mostly as as mess as best as I could focusing on site identification, so not putting it under a microscope, because that's often how, uh, in my core, how we do the sorting. Um, so if you can master site identification, you're 80% you're of the way there with dipterins. And there's some things like, like tapulids that you will end up having to put under a microscope. But so you can't get away from the microscope entirely. But what I do in this in this presentation is, is give as many tips as I can to, to learning those. I mentioned the June training that we did. Here again is the link for that. And then we just have listed other macroinvertebrate uh, resources for you to enhance your practice. Uh, you know, this stuff just takes repeated exposure, repeated practice. Um, one nice thing is about, about participating in my core is that you get that, you know, it's certainly at least twice a year, you have to think hard about your macroinvertebrate identification and keep the, the rust from forming around your brain. So these are just pieces that, that will help you um, improve and, 
and um, help you, uh, you know, just help you get better at it. Though I think of all of these, this this macroinvertebrates.org is probably the one worth highlighting because it's newish, like within the last five years, and they have really good pictures on it. You can zoom up really close and see all the characters. So like even having that up while you're doing your own identification could be really useful for you. Okay, so I think that's that's it for me. Um, how are we doing, Tamara? Did any questions roll in? Uh, let me, I was putting some stuff in the chat myself, so hold on. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, awesome, you got the links in there. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I don't see any questions yet. We do have about 11 minutes for questions, and this is really a great opportunity to even just chat with Paul and myself. Um, you know, informally, go ahead and turn on your video if you just want to talk about something you've struggled with, with identification of not only the dipterans, but other identification hurdles um, or other questions you have. This is a great opportunity to just uh, chime in. Or questions about the, the scoring system. Like I'm looking through the names here a lot, not everybody, but a lot of you are are leaders of your um, macroinvertebrate monitoring programs. So um, that's a new thing and I'll, I can take questions on that. Um, one thing that I, I've, that's been emailed to me quite a bit is um, when, when is that new system going to be available online? It's not yet. So we, don't, we, we haven't had the database set up yet uh, to allow the, for data entry on it. So what I've been telling people to do is just hang on to your data sheets. Well, we're working on it, but all of our computer expertise has been directed at, at getting the, the lake registration side of things going. My hope is that this winter, this spring, we're really gonna start getting into making the stream side of the database up and running. So it will be there. Um, just continue to be patient with us as we, as we um, do this. Really, it's pretty time-consuming stuff to to figure all that out. Well, if they're using the old method still, because that's still allowed, correct? Um, they can enter. Can they enter that data? Yeah, the old the old system is still on there, so you can still enter it the way the way we used to. Yeah, and I'll just put in a plug here that um, to, if you haven't been entering your data to make sure you get caught up if you can because we do use it. Um, Paul, did you want to, nobody else has put in a question yet that I see. Um, I don't see any hands up or... Here's one from Lara. Oh, okay. uh, are there any dipterans that almost made the cut to be listed as more sensitive? Wow. Oh. Hmm. Really good question. And I just can't remember all I, what I have actually. So, so this is how you would find the answer. Go to our website um, and go to the stream documents page. And on there, you can bring up the family level um, document uh, where it lists the sensitivities for every single family. And then you can see the, uh, the, the, the specific family sensitivity rating. So you'll be able to see the continuum of diptera. Um, that, would be, that would be the best way. Um, I, offhand, I don't remember. And I was gonna say, I got it pulled up. You could see what other ones, so. Pollution really? tolerant scuds, actually, let's see. Pollution tolerant scuds. So actually, uh, I'm probably still sharing my screen, right? Um, okay, so let's just take a look at this. SCUDs. SCUDs are rated as a four. That is my practical experience with SCUDs. Whoops. Is that I can pretty much find them anywhere. Um, 
and at least in the Huron River watershed. And I, I'm honestly not, sh but, but, but the, but the literature has them at a four. So I, you know, I had to go with the literature and not my own particular experience in that regard. Um, because uh, I didn't know if I'm biased by the particular areas I tend to sample. You know, so that's my take on scuds. Um, I feel like maybe they should be lower based on personal experience, but that's not, that's not what the research shows. I'm still learning the new system myself, but um, you know, with our state procedure, we definitely take into account if there's something, if a, a community is dominated by something. Um, so it's a good point. That's true. Yeah. So this this doesn't really. That's true. This doesn't really get at an evenness type of uh, index, does it? It's not the strength of this particular uh, Hilsenhoff IBI. That's what this is. This is a Hilsenhoff IBI. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't really get at that evenness question. And I think it also. Um is a reminder for everybody to look for everything. Scuds are big and they move around a lot. And so they're easier to uh, pick out. And so um, even though you might find a hundred scuds, there also might be a hundred chironobids there or a um, hundred mosquito larvae there. <laughs> so um, yeah. just the, the importance of picking everything and um, keeping everything. I forget exactly, Paul, what the exact procedures are. Yeah, basically, I mean, that's what I, that's what I tell people is that you got to keep, you got to keep everything within that time frame, um, and make sure, you know, you just have to constantly train your volunteers to, to look for the tiny stuff as, as well as going for that easy stuff that might be, they might tend to, to grab with their forceps. Um, Ron asked, do you give instruction if you see 10 or more of some number to stop picking that particular type? We don't do that anymore. So we used to do that, Ron. And I, but I saw through my work with the Huron River Watershed Council, that just, it, it introduces too much volunteer judgment into the process. Um, most of these people have, who, who volunteer with us have very little experience. So you're asking them to make judgment calls and stuff they've never learned and they will leave behind uh, they'll, and they'll make mistakes if they stop picking, you know, scuds is one thing. Scuds, I guess are fairly easy, but to identify, but then when you start doing that for caddisflies and you start doing that for mayflies and then, then the errors start multiplying on themselves. So I've decided, you know, it's better to just keep on picking everything uh, your end result will show the general distribution of, of re that should be reflective of, of the community. Um, one thing Kyle asks, uh, do you know of any alternative indices that account for that issue? One thing I do consistently is uh, I'll, I'll always do uh, a diversity count as well, like a family count. We found 15 insect families in this sample and I'll still track I, I, I see this this Hilsenhoff IBI as an addition to that and not a full replacement. So I'll still count total number of insect families. I'll still count um, EPT families. you know that's a classic one that the state likes to use. I'll still count uh, families that are very, very sensitive between zero and two on this scale. I'll, I'll count the number of families of those that pop up. Um, you know, so what we want to do when we when we uh, do this uh, database update is to make sure that that type of indice is available for use as well as the IBI. Like no, because no one number can can tell the whole story. So I want to get all of those pieces in there, easy for people to find. Um, now give the best reflection of what's going on. So that if you do end up with a four, but uh, it's 100% scuds, it gives you some context there. Um, 
Yeah. Now, now all of this, of course, plays to the strength of identifying stuff at the family level. Uh, so as much as you can, I encourage all groups to identify insects on the family level. Um, because it, you don't get as accurate of results if you were to do like a diversity count at the order level. So. And I think I said this at the training in the, in June, but um, if you are interested in going to the family level, um, but you maybe need some extra help, more resources, um, you can always reach out to me and I can see if, the watershed biologist in your area is interested in coming and helping out at an ID day um, or something like that. I've done that before. So that's just a reminder that that is maybe one option. Mm -hmm. All right, we just have a minute left. I guess uh, Heather has one more question. Oh. They, they did this procedure and they're having groups. Sometimes they're getting 150, sometimes they're getting 500. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of also depends on um, the number of pickers you have. You know, I try to limit teams to, to five. I mean, that's that's my recommendation. That's total team num teammates. Uh, so if you can, if at, if at all possible, if you can uh, break these teams up so that smaller numbers go, so you're not collecting 500, that would be one option to to get about that issue, then you might have three people only doing the, the picking and you will end up with 500. Maybe you'll end up with 200. Um, so that's one way, um, you know, I, I, but I haven't, I haven't fully come to grips with how to stop teams with keeping that many and still having it be accurate. Cause the, at the end of the day, they're, they're just beginners at this stuff and you just really need to give them straightforward directions, do this, um, so for now, just have them keep on picking everything. Maybe a, a better solution will present itself in the future. Okay, well, thanks everybody for attending. Um, just a reminder that we are having our lunch now, uh, lunch break 12 to one and that we will start back up at one with the next keynote speaker, um, Kat Kavanaugh from the Water Rangers of Canada. So that should be great and interesting. So reach out to Paul or I if you have any additional questions. Um, our information's on our website. If you don't already have our email handy, but I have a feeling you probably do, most of you. All right, everyone, thanks a lot.